Welcome to the Story Copywriter Podcast. The show that teaches you everything you need to know to write stories that sell and become the written voice of a business you love. With me, your host and founder of Story Copywriters, Rob Drummond. As we head into the middle of 2023, I'm more convinced than ever of the need to collaborate in business, the need to connect with like-minded people who share your values, and I may be doing similar work to what you're doing. That's one of my goals with the Story Copywriter podcast this year, is to bring you more voices from people in the trenches doing this work on a day-to-day basis. On today's call, I speak to Bill Mueller. Bill is an email copywriter and storyteller that I know through Perry Marshall's group. So he's also a student of Perry Marshall and steeped in direct marketing principles. And I think this is quite telling because really what we're doing here is we're blending traditional direct response principles with the art of storytelling and authentic communications. So I think you'll enjoy this conversation. Let's jump in. So, Bill, uh, welcome to the Story Copywriter Podcast. It's great to have you here. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Good to see you. Great. Um, Perhaps just for the benefit of anyone listening, you could share a slice of your story that explains who you are and what you do. Sure. Uh, Well, in a nutshell, I'm a copywriter. Uh, I used to be in the the world of journalism, writing for newspapers, and then later uh, some freelance work with magazines and different publications. Got into the uh, copywriting side in the late 90s, early 2000s. A friend of mine wanted to to write a book. And, uh, you know, everybody's got an idea for a book, right? And then until it comes time to uh, actually write it, and he knew my background. So we did an interesting thing. We basically just recorded a QA and a conversation back and forth over the period. He's a basketball friend of mine. So before our Saturday basketball game, we would get there 30 minutes early. I, this tells you how long ago it was. I would plug a cassette tape into the boom box. I would ask him a bunch of questions. He would unload his expertise on me. He, he, had, he was a really good expert in the field. We transcribed those conversations almost, I don't want to say verbatim, but they were in Q&A format which is something I saw, by the way, uh, done by, you'll know these two names, uh, Jim Edwards and Joe Vitale. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? They had a product called like 33 Days to Ebook Profits or something like that. Their book was, yeah, their book was just all Q&A. And I thought it was really useful. So I said, let's start that, you know, MVP mode, minimally viable product, put up a sales page. This was back in the days of uh, like 2003, I think it was. Google AdWords was just getting started. You could drive at the time traffic right to a, a sales letter. Clicks were, we were getting clicks as low as seven you can cents. People to an affiliate offer, even like Halcyon days. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, you could at the yeah. time. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Google Cash with Chris Carpenter, I think, or Matt Carpenter. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of things you could do. And we, we kind of rode that for a while. We ended up um, building a business out of that. We did that for, uh, nine years. So that's how I cut my teeth in the world of internet marketing and learned all about copywriting. And then I started doing that for clients. And then uh, three years ago, I started kind of hanging out my own shingle, my own business called Story Sales Machine, where I teach businesses and copywriters and anybody who wants to learn how to use stories uh, in their business to sell, which is something you're quite the expert in. So um, it's a fun lane to be in because, you know, as much as 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 qualified and as good as I am in copywriting, I always had a real skepticism toward it because I was raised in a household that was super skeptical. And I don't know your background too well, I, although it's, you know, you described it pretty well in your book. I don't know if you have any background in journalism, but my gosh, if you work in the editorial department of a newspaper, you learn and are trained to hate advertising. So I had to kind of overcome that learn about um advertising in a different way <clears throat> and I one of my favorite that. books is um so there's a book propping up my monitor at the moment called the book of gossage and um written by howard gossage it was published posthumously he ran an advertising agency in the 1960s and his book was about is advertising worth saving so this is not a new conversation yeah but i gotta say advertising's 
kind of come a long way and I'm, I'm fascinated by it now. Sure. I hit the fast forward button like a lot of people, but uh, you know, just as an example, Nike um, going more aspirational instead of tearing you down, like, you know, the old, the old fifties ads where you're nothing without our deodorant or our soap. And Nike went the other way by saying, Hey, just do it. Be aspirational. Look at all the stuff they're doing with like female athletes and, um, there's a great book, if anybody wants to read it, that explains a lot of this, Story Wars by Jonah Sachs, where I forget his last name, I should know it, but it's a great book. So advertising really has kind of evolved, but mm. um, and so have my views on it. Yeah, it's it's funny about this sort of journalism background. Like I've I have a feeling that everyone just kind of kind of falls into being a copywriter, like no one sets out at the start of their career being, yes, I want to go and be a copywriter. We just kind of fall into it because it's a required skill. And then once you get into it, you realize that it can be very interesting. That's a pretty good point. You know, I never really thought about that. I know a lot of people seem to get into it because it pays well. Hmm. And a lot of writers, whether they're freelance writers, they run into, and I certainly ran into this in the journalism world where it doesn't really pay very well, even at the higher levels, hmm. major newspapers or magazines, it's not lucrative as even a mid-level copywriter probably so yeah but you're right I, I think a lot of people kind of run across it but i think when people do run across it a certain segment become very fascinated and are very attracted to the appeal of it like the conversational aspect of it and the persuasion is fascinating you know the fact that you're persuading people um i think I that's think part of interesting it to me is like a lot of the best books seem to have were written about 60 70 years ago and haven't gone out of date and on that basis, probably won't go out of dates. Um, um, perhaps that's not entirely true. Um, I think there's a few, but there's a few modifications, maybe. But the underlying principles don't seem to change very much. Yeah, you mean like direct response copywriting? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean the the principles really don't change. It's amazing how much some of the same things work, which amazes me because see that's part of my skepticism um, model is that. I'll read a sales letter and think, my gosh, I've, I've heard these phrases all, you know, over and over again, but I know they convert. So it's hard to put myself sometimes in the seat of a customer because for them, especially in the non-money-making niches, that's copywriting is new to them. So if they read a sales letter that starts with the classic Gary Halbert opening of, if you blank, then this is the most important letter you'll ever read. I would do an eye roll seeing that or at least know what's coming, but your average person in a non, you know, in the grow orchids niche or something, mm -hmm. that's going to really speak to them. And that's, that's great. Yep. I agree. What kind of storytelling work are you doing for your, for your clients then? Uh, with just all kinds, you know, uh, right now the lane I'm in is emails. So that's kind of my specialty, but I've, I've done it all reading, writing ads and sales pages, landing pages, uh, even blog posts, but uh, and even advising people on how to tell their story. So um, I'm not doing so much client work now. So now I just kind of teach people how to do it. But um, emails, email was attractive to me because it's it's it to me it's the most money being left on the table that businesses just aren't aware of. It's the easiest win to get for a client. Yeah, it's the highest ROI channel uh, yeah. usually. Yep, it sure is. And um, I actually, a lot of a lot of copywriters don't like writing sales letters because they they take a long time and they're so involved. I actually like doing all putting all those together. But uh, there is something about email where it's more casual, it's quicker, it's just seems easier, it's more conversational. I mean, you really should, at least I do, even if I'm writing for a client, think about writing from one friend, like I'm writing to one specific person. In fact, I don't even use like a word processing app. I kind of open up a blank Gmail because it gives me the feeling that I'm just writing an email to a, a one other person. That's nice. Yeah. 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 And I guess it is like quite a, a warm medium. It is quite a personal medium. That's kind of the reasons that I've always been drawn to it. I think as well, like I actually consume quite a lot of email out of preference but only from people that I've specifically opted into and are providing value to me. Yeah, that, that's what I like about email too. It's really one-on-one. -on -one. 
And I tell people it's it's a surprising, I think people discount this or don't think of it. It's a pretty intimate platform because when you open an email, it's just you and the person who wrote it. Whereas if if I'm reading a, a Facebook comment or a blog post or a copy on a website, there could be 5,000 people reading the same thing. And you don't see them, obviously. It's still just you and the screen. But there's something about email. It comes into your inbox and it could be next to an email from your mom. I mean, it's just it's just kind of sitting there with all your personal stuff, too. And you open it up. And depending on how it's written, it could really give you a feeling of that person is just talking to you. And that's that's hard to do, like on a, on a web page or in other formats. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Are you um kind of encouraging your clients to send regular kind of broadcast style emails, or is it more kind of people opt in? You're going to send them a kind of fixed sequence. Yeah, I like I like doing a hybrid. Um, if you're going to be offering something for free you know, as an opt-in, like say a lead magnet or a free ebook. I like doing some sort of sequence anywhere from three to 10 messages, but I kind of recommend pretty quickly uh, segueing to broadcast, fresh broadcast. There's just something about that that seems fresher. But if you capture that email lead right away, I think it's a good, a good idea to kind of steer them toward what you want. And, you know, another, another good idea is if you've been writing broadcast emails long enough and you're tracking your results, you can use the best ones or elements of the best ones in that welcome sequence because that's there's no better time to really grab them and get them get their loyalty than it, than that that first you know sequence. Yeah, I'm just in the process of doing that or rather redoing that for my own sequences because um, I find it much harder to work on my own sequences than I do on someone else's, which is always the case. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I come from more of a marketing automation background where people are trying to kind of automate the entire customer journey. And I think it ends up being a little bit impersonal or people kind of lose track of what's being sent out. Yeah, there, you know, it's very appealing because that's kind of like your business that's on dream. autopilot. It's a dream. Mm -hmm. And there's it's not untrue. Uh, I had a client for years and it worked great for him. And he had a very large list. It worked like a champ for a long time. And then it just kind of gradually started. There's something about the automated sequence that's sort of aged, even though the reader couldn't necessarily tell. There's just something about it. The performance drops off. It's a mysterious thing to me because I can't really explain it. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of makes sense to me. Yeah, it does. I, I don't really know why. but So we kind of segued to fresh broadcasts and, and things improved. Yeah. I'm um, sort of in the process of... So I sent... Um, a daily email, so a daily being five days a week. So I sent an email five days a week for about three and a half years. And I'm now in the process of kind of revisiting that body of work and figuring out, well, what can I kind of reuse here? Because a lot of the stories are still interesting. I would maybe phrase them slightly, slightly differently or, or my voice has changed. Um, but I'm, I'm in the process of that. And I, I, I sort of feel like, yes, you want the, the ongoing fresh out of the pan content that is you today it's your voice today but then i also think that there's value in kind of revisiting the work that you've sent in the past as well yeah it's funny you mention that because um you know i've got hundreds and hundreds of emails that i've written in the last three years and when i go back to the old ones and and by old i mean even as recent as a year and a half two years ago i'm like struck by wow that that's a really good email like i'm, I'm reading it for the first time yeah I, I've kind of rerun emails before, kind of mixed and matched them and taken parts. So I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's there's that's content that you created and there's no reason it should go out once and that's it. Mm. If it's relevant to your audience, of course. Yeah. In the sort of run up to, the, to this call, we were talking about kind of a few ideas and you mentioned that people having the confidence to tell stories is kind of a major problem that you see people having um I wondered if we could talk about that yeah you know what I think it might be the biggest problem and to me it's uh I get it but I think people when they sit down to write an email they think they need to put this professional corporate hat on or something and all of a sudden I'm capital W writing and instead I just tell people look it's just it's just talking on paper you're just talking in fact I recommend that people kind of dictate their emails if they want but yeah it's interesting I mean Think about it. People are telling stories all day long, whether it's something that happened in the grocery store or 
you know, we basically just tell stories all day. So, but people really do seem to be um, hesitant to kind of do it on their own. They, they feel like they need some sort of formal training or they need to be a novelist or story, storyteller. And it's just not true. It's almost like if you really think about the act of walking and you really think about the act of like lifting one leg up, planting it on the ground, shifting your weight across, lifting the other leg up. And if you're really thinking about it, you're going to overthink it and you're going to fall over. Whereas if you're just dictating it, it's like you just do it without thinking. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you can overthink, you can overthink it. Um, now, I, I go against the popular writing advice to just kind of blurt out a first draft as quickly as you can. I have I've always had trouble doing that. It's harder for me to move on to the next sentence until the one I just wrote is pretty well the, the way I like it. Mm. But I think for most people, there's a lot of value in just getting it out and then going back and rewriting it. Mm. Should it be entertaining? I think that's that's. The primary thing and i think that's another mistake uh a lot of businesses make yes you want to provide value and educate your audience absolutely and you want to talk about all those things in your content but i don't care how useful whatever it is you're talking about people will drop off you know if you don't keep it entertaining and the great thing about keeping it entertaining is that you know if you're a business and you have a different line of uh, various products and you know, they're not going to appeal to all your customers, but if, if almost all your emails are really entertaining, they're going to open up all those emails and they're never going to drop off because they always are going to get that dopamine hit of something in the email, whether it was a, a funny line you wrote or an image you used or um, just a storyline that was interesting, or you shared something personal from your life and they know, hey, Bill's the kind of guy that will tell me something interesting about his day maybe, and or he mixes it up. Some of the emails are long and short. Um I actually need improvement on that because most of mine are pretty long, but, um, you know, I think that's how the bottom line to me is that if you're not entertaining, then you're just, you could probably do okay. But I just think it works really a lot better if you can be as entertaining as you can. Yeah, and I think, th and think of, of that scope. first. I think there's a lot of scope for it. I was, as you were talking, I was thinking of, um, Oren Claff who wrote, um, pitch anything. And he, um, so he's a, I guess, a sales trainer, offer coach. Um, but he sends very interesting emails and very entertaining emails. And I'm unlikely to ever buy his courses, but um, he was the person who came to mind as, as you were talking there. Yeah, I, I, I've got emails coming into my inbox. I'm not even in their market. But, but they're just so interesting or funny or entertaining that I will open up some of their emails just to kind of see what they're up to. Do you think that the entertainment has to be sort of vaguely on topic or, you know, are you racing about whatever you, baseball or something? No, I, I don't think it has to be on topic at all. In fact, I don't think it should be all the time because you know, again, variety. And I'm a big believer that you can trend, you can segue from topic X to almost anything else. I, I really believe that. And I think the more you make it about not your, your, your topic and make it about your topic. Sure. Maybe even a lot of the time, but I never hesitate to uh, pull stories from all kinds of places about all kinds of topics. Mm. I am. Um, I think this is probably, probably the biggest misconception that I run into with clients where they think that everything they send out has to be very aligned with what they're doing otherwise people will lose interest and I think that's only true for a subset of the list I think that's potentially only true for people who are right on the verge of buying yeah they're, all, they're all that's not going to be the majority of the list I agree I mean they're all people so I get that all the time. Hey, well, this worked for B2B, business to business. And, you know, they think that they need to write white papers and official, you know, lapse into corporate speak because they, they need to stay official and they can't, you know, go off the trail and talk about something else. I just think that uh, um, you can and should. Mm -hmm. I'd like to explore length a little bit. 
I mean, just, just thinking about a lot of my emails, like probably not that long. Like, I think I'm probably sending between about 400 and 800 words ish, maybe some longer, but that's probably about the average. I just have a feeling that like this, there's more benefit in sending more frequently and being more consistent than in, you know, if, if you are, so perhaps you're a different case because you do this full time, but if someone is just doing this around running a business, then maybe there's more benefit from sending a shorter email more, more frequently, as long as it's still entertaining and interesting. I, I would agree. I would agree. In fact, I'm, I'm, I would like to move more toward that. It's just that when I get my hooks into a story and I'm writing the email, I just find so many tangents and I'm just having a good time with it. You're, it's interesting to hear your average. Uh, it's cool that you would say that. I, mine is just a little bit longer than yours. I would say my average is probably more like 600 to 800. If I can okay. get an email done in 400, that that's pretty good. Yeah. You know, but people ask me all the time, you know, how long it should it be? And I, my answer is it, it can never be too long. It can only be too boring. Yes. Um, now I do, I do hear from people sometimes pushing back, like who really reads all these emails? You know, I'm not going to appeal to everyone. I've, I've had emails as long as 1500 words, but I've had other people reply to those 1500 word emails saying, oh my God, that was just such an incredible story. I'm forwarding this to three people. So, you know, I look at it and I think it's good, but there's a lot of value in short stuff too. And I, I, like I said earlier, I would like to do a better job in mixing it up. Mine tend to be kind of the same length. And I think there's a lot of value to just throwing a two paragraph email out there and then something else uh, the next day. As long as it illustrates a really important insight or something that has just occurred to you, that does in effect shine the light of insight onto the thing that is really important. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as, keep as it long as it's valuable, I guess. Yeah, valuable and you know relevant to doesn't have to be exactly relevant to their business like we were saying before, but yeah, there's got to be some point. You just can't be rambling or throwing tossing off anything that's interesting to you that has nothing to do with the business. Yeah, you you mentioned um, humor and being funny um, to me before the call, and I've I've always I've always kind of shied away from like addressing the topic of being funny head on. And I don't know if this is like a British thing of, I've, I've a very, I, I obviously do have a sense of humor, but it's a very dry sense of humor. <laughs> um, I wondered if you could speak to that, like, should people try to, in, 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 in being entertaining, should people try to be humorous or is it just a function of you being yourself and using your authentic voice? Yeah, I think that's that's well said right there. If you try and force it, it's going to it's going to sound forced. If you're not naturally funny in print, don't try and force it. And if you can't, you know, some, you know, I'm a big believer that you can kind of I think talent is overrated. I think people can become uh whatever they want. Like in fact, there's a great book with that exact title, Talent is Overrated, Daniel Coyne, I think is the author. So I'm a big believer in that, but some people are just naturally funny. Um I can be naturally and funny in print and I'm kind of witty in person, but I'm not like a funny person. Like Will Ferrell is to me a person that he walks into the room and there's just something about his bearing. That's just funny. I don't have that. Um, so in print, um, it's easy for me to be witty because I can do that. And I think people can get funnier, but if they try and force it, uh, it doesn't work. And if you're not naturally funny, I wouldn't worry about it. Just, just be yourself. And everyone has quirks. Just just let your real personality uh, show through. And even if it's not super funny, if you can be authentic and genuine, that's the number one thing. That trumps being funny. If, you, cool. if you're an authentic, sincere person looking to help your audience, they'll stick with you forever. I basically think that we're trying to replicate a face-to-face -face interaction, but do it at scale. And obviously, that requires i think there's some differences like if you're face to face because you've got this because you because you've got face to face communication then you know if i'm speaking i will probably probably use different language if i'm speaking face to face like i might even occasionally swear because it's contextual and i can get away with that face to face but i feel like i can't do that 
in email because I think the context is missing. So perhaps there's a few subtle differences. Yeah, I, I think there's some truth to that. Uh, lately in my emails, I've been going on these little, I'll do tangents um, and just go off on a riff and I'll put it in a smaller font. Like it's almost like a David Foster Wallace doing footnotes that, that go on for pages. I find those funny. I'll follow him down anywhere because I happen to like him. Um, and sometimes if I find a, a little side comment, I'm able to make in an email, I'll kind of do that. And, uh, you know, they might not necessarily be quote unquote funny, but they're, they're kind of odd and peculiar to me. And I think they're, it's different. So I think being different is another form of being funny. Mm -hmm. So, but it's a good point about it. it's, it's a different format. I'm, I'm sure I'm a different experience in person than I am in emails, but that's, yeah. that's pretty normal. But there's a correlation, I guess. Yeah, but and no matter what, everyone's got a voice. You know, a Frank Kern email sounds a certain way, and an Andre Chaperone email sounds a certain way. And if you met them in person, it might might not be a complete match. But that's nothing wrong with that. I've just finished reading a, a book of essays by George Orwell, and he writes he's writing about Dickens, and he was, towards the end of that essay, he's saying that when you read. Uh, he's talking about a work of fiction, but when you read something, you can almost envision the face of the author behind the page. And that, mm. that, that kind of comes across. And you can't see it clearly, but you get a feel for it. Yeah, that's I like that comment a lot. Um, kind of the corollary to that might be, I forget who the author was, but she said something like when she writes she has this image of someone in a bookstore pulling her book off the shelf for the first time. And she's writing to that person. And I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. But being able to picture um, the author. Yeah. I mean, if you can't picture them visually, you can get a sense of who they are and how many times have we um, really gotten into somebody's world uh, through literature or whatever. And then you finally see them or see them interviewed and you're like really taken aback because you had a different, impression that's right where do you um where are the most likely places that you find inspiration for things to write about oh uh well from my own life and observation so i've kind of trained myself to just kind of notice everything like i you know people ask me all the time where where do where do i get stories and i go well probably six things happened to you today that could have made for a good email. You just didn't have your radar out because everything's a story. The, you know, what's that saying? The most mundane is the most uh, appealing to people. Whereas the. Well, it's only uh, mundane because it happens to you and you think it's normal. Say again. It's only mundane because it happened to you and it's probably yes. fairly normal. Yeah. And people are fascinated by the mundane because they recognize themselves in it. And, and especially if it's something that people don't talk a lot about. Um, are you documenting these ideas i mean so i i get a flurry of, of ideas like i don't know they seem to come in the shower or when i'm on a run or at like four in the morning and i have to find bizarre ways of documenting them otherwise they kind of evaporate into the atmosphere yeah i actually i have a spreadsheet on my computer it's, I think it's up to 674 rows now of different ideas. I'll never get to all of them, so I'll never run out of ideas. Uh, but I capture them wherever I go. And it's I don't really have one system. Uh, I used to carry three by five cards with me. That was easy. Uh, a lot of times now I'll pull out my smartphone and just dictate a quick note. And then in my daily to-dos, I will make sure and process that and file it into the spreadsheet. But um you know, me and my wife, we watch Netflix and the TV's on here and there. There's stuff that pops up everywhere. And yeah. you know, there's some there's some sub stacks and newsletters and different things that, you know, I see online that spark ideas. And there's, you know, certainly some Twitter accounts that post uh, interesting stories. And so they're, they're all take a screenshot place. of things are live. It's if it's electronic. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great one too. I've even taken I've even taken photos of I've even paused Netflix on the on the telly and taken a photo <laughs> of the telly and then added that photo into Evernote with some comments. <laughs> I've done the same thing. I drive my wife crazy. I'll say hit pause and I'll run into my room and I'll I have a portable um 
it's one of those Olympus uh, digital recorders that, you know, reporters will use to when they interview athletes or whatever. And I'll go, that's an email right there. I just need to record this for about two minutes. And she, it could, she's like shaking her head like, oh. yeah, she's, well, she's used to it by now, but yeah, you know, it's, uh, you know, the, the, you, you do have to take the time to, to file these things. Otherwise you will forget them. If my wife wakes up at like half two in the morning and finds me like frantically writing in the dark on a notepad by the bed, then yeah, again, she, she just kind of shakes her head and turns over. But, yeah. Yeah. I, I literally ordered uh the I I figured there had to be one of these and there and there is. It's a ballpoint pen when you click the button, it shines a light out the front. So you nice. don't have to put on the big light. You could just kind of write in the dark that way. Yeah. I just kind of write big and guess. And um <laughs> <laughs> but 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 for me, it, as long as I've got as long as, as long as I can see what the word is, it will remind me the next day what my thought process was. I just need a prompt to remind me to go down that groups again yeah yeah <clears throat> i used to keep a little recording device near my bed but it's it's just so god awful to hear your voice the next day what you sounded like at two in the morning trying to dictate so yeah. i stopped doing that yeah that yeah, could you mentioned um the importance or the the fact that images really underrated and i wondered how you were using is this Im so would, would this be images within an email Images within an email. I think it's just really underused and dismissed. And uh, I think some people even snub their nose at them. Like it's it's beneath me to put a picture in. Um, but, you know, humans were way more um, adapted to and processing pictures before the printed word came along. So I think Scott Galloway is the one who has a great stat. He's like... Um, People process images 65% faster than the written word. And they're also, I think they're way better at, I'm a fan of beautiful writing, but if you want to convey an emotion, um, a picture can certainly do that. And, you know, we've all heard the phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words. I've even opened some emails by saying, take a look at this picture. And it's a stunning picture of something that I know I can write about. And take a look at this picture is a very compelling subject line as well, right? I would probably at least at least look at the picture to see what, yeah. what it was. Yeah. And I use uh, GIFs or GIFs, however you want to pronounce it. Um, those are also a good way to inject some humor. That's speaking of try, uh, trying to be funny or if you want to be funnier in your emails, you can borrow funny by, you know, just having a good sense of what sort of GIF to put in or a meme. Now, sometimes your sense of humor on those things might not be what others are, and you got to kind of use pretty good judgment. So I would say be a little careful with that. But, and, you know, and there's, you could make the case that GIFs are, you know, once they're going to be, once they're overdone, then the effectiveness is going to go down. But I think uh, a well-placed one can still work really well. Mm. And I was, uh, yeah, I was just thinking as you were talking, like, what are the emails that I'm, working on in my kind of initial sequence that goes out when people opt in is about a time I, that I accidentally hired a motorbike in Colombia. And um, I have lots of photos from that trip, obviously, and I could put a photo in that is, it's not obviously not a stock image and it illustrates that it, it was beautiful. Like the, the surroundings were beautiful. And I, I described that in the story, but I was thinking it might, it might, it might just guard the reader's imagination a little. Yeah, I'll give you a good example. I like to do that in the PS. Um, I recently, not recently, but it's probably at least a year ago, I wrote, wrote an email about the story of how the book uh, A River Runs Through It got made into a movie and how um, William Hurt tried to get the starring role and didn't get it. And it's a long involved story. And it was a pretty good email. And then I, I, put as a PS in the email, the story of when I read that book, it's a really short book. And I read it at a really beautiful spot. So I, I went to Google images because I didn't want to drive and take a picture of the place. But I, I was like, this is the actual bench I sat on and read the book. And it was a nice little thing in the PS to, to kind of, it's a, a pictures can be a really nice way to add a personal touch to share a little bit, something from your life. And it's, that's going to help bond you to your, uh, you know, reader a little bit more. Mm. Do you, so the question is, is do you journal? And I want to just explain that I do journal, but I journal in the evening and I, and I maintain a sort of page 
page a, page a day diary. But what I'm going to, this is something I've been talking about and meaning to do, but my plan is to go through for previous years and print out, like physically print out, say 20 to 30 photos and staple them into, into the diary. So that, that because, that, because I think it will transform last year's diary into almost like a scrapbook of my life that actually is more interesting, I mm -hmm. think for me and potentially for anyone who to stumble across it rather than just my scrolls of things that I was worried about that day or that, that, that was something that came to mind the other thing I, I used to do for journaling was I used to actually journal electronically in Evernote and then I would add in into the note I'd add in some photos because obviously I'm 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 usually taking well I've got small kids so I'm always taking photos of them and the things that they're up to so I used to create each day would have a I had a notebook in Evernote and each day would be a different note. And then I'd make some notes on what I did, but I used to add some images, some photos in as well. I wonder what you, what you did or do um, in, in, in regards to journaling. Yeah, it's, it's, I've been journaling for decades. I started in the early eighties and I have some of them were handwritten. I have handwritten journals. Most of them, I even, this is how old I am. Some of them were hammered out on typewriters. And then word processors came along and I pretty much saved them all. I've got stacks and stacks of papers. I'm just in the last couple of years, I've been wondering how I want to deal with that. I do kind of want to get them digitized. I've been scanning them into Evernote and I did the same thing you did. I have a different note for each day. And I, I would like to kind of print them out or something, but then, you know, they're hard to look at too, because I've grown as a person and it's kind of cringy mm -hmm. to go back in your journals and it's just you don't want to throw them out but you don't want anybody to see them either it's kind of a kind of a kind of a thing so I journal less than I used to because I think honestly for me a lot of journaling years ago for me was kind of working stuff out in my head and I think I kind of worked out some of those things but I do really like having a record of what I was thinking about and doing that day because I think if I'm a 95 years old and sitting in a rocking chair, it's going to be really cool to go back and just relive all those memories and, and see what you were doing. And I think it's kind of cool to have a record of all that. I think as well, like one of my biggest regrets in life. So after I finished my, my degree, I went to South America for six months, hence the Colombian motorbike incident. Um, one of my biggest regrets in life is not maintaining a journal while I was there day to day. And then I tried to write it retrospectively. So towards the end of my trip, I realized, crap, I need to like write down what I've been doing. And then I got through about a third of the trip and I just found that too much time had passed between what I was writing about yeah. and when I was, <clears throat> and, and the day that I was writing. So the detail was kind of lost and it's, it's a big regret actually, because I think I now tell a lot of stories about that trip, but those stories will, will be better told if I had the if I had reference to the specifics of who I'd spoken to, the actual yeah. interactions, the actual specifics of where I'd been and what had happened. I, I'd be able to tell a story in a way that would bring it to life a lot more. I can totally relate. I've had trips where I had good intentions of just writing writing it down, and I, I've tried to do the same thing, reconstruct it. It just evaporates uh, too quickly, and you can't capture the same essence. And here's the thing. Rob, I think you'll agree that even if here's where the regret comes in, because I've experienced that same regret. I mean, if I, I pay a lot of money to have every single day of my life kind of documented in some way. I just think that would be really cool. Maybe that's an obsessive compulsive thing, but I regret that there's these gaps and all it would take is literally five minutes before bed. Like just pick one thing um, from your day. Uh, Matthew Dix is a is a verbal storyteller. Mm. He has a great technique where you just you just pick the one story worthy moment from the day, and you don't even have to write that many lines about it because if you just kind of write a sentence or two, it'll come back. And uh, I wish so. When you're talking about going on a trip and you didn't document it, that's all it would have taken. It's like five minutes a day. I used to make a note of that on my journal. Was what was the one thing that if I yeah what was the one moment and it, it, it's from Matthew Dix. Um, and I, I've kind of stopped doing it, and perhaps I should go back and start doing that again. You know what they have? Have you ever been to a, in a bookstore and they have these these little tiny journals? They're called the five year journal. 
and you open it up and it's um it's the five-year journal so one page has is divided into four and at the top it would be 2023 um whatever the date is and then right below it would be the next year 2024 and then 2025 and you just progress through the pages each page is a different day with four different years and so you would have that book for for years and think about that and and it's just really it's just like five lines so it's really short so that that's that's a good format to kind of keep track of all that i kind of keep a spreadsheet as well i track workouts and stuff but i also like try and write just a few words about maybe something that happened that day and it's easy i like it i like the spreadsheet format because it's easy to scan you can see everything at a glance mm -hmm. but there's all kinds of ways to try and keep up with it i have a feeling that maybe people don't do it because there's a almost deterministic attitude of like well how am i going to use it and it's like well you don't know at that time it's not that kind of exercise it's not like i am recording this because i'm going to convert it into a story i think there's a, maybe a period a period of reflection that has to happen between you documenting it and and deciding yes i want to write a story about that yeah i i think just a lot of people they're just not interested in, in doing it they just they, they, they don't see like i i love the idea of doing it because I know what it feels like to look back and read some of those things. It's like fascinating. It's your life we're talking about. And, and it's, it's, it's lost if you don't write it down a little bit of it. And I, I don't like that. Um, I don't like having to, to, to have lost it. So, but not everybody's into it. Like my wife, for example, she would never dream of writing things down and keeping a journal. It just, it's just not, not her thing. Yeah. Great. Um, can we talk about some tips for, so you're showing up in someone's inbox every day, every week, whatever it is. Do you have any specific tips for grabbing their attention, encouraging them to open the email? Yeah. Um, let me turn that off. Yeah, well, uh, you know, the subject line is obviously important, but I think more important is if you write consistently entertaining, informative emails that that show you are a sincere person that wants to help them, then the subject line becomes less important because they yeah, look at it's about who the it's name. It's about the sender name. Um, it drives me I, nuts when people change their sender name and it, this email comes in. I'm like, who on earth is John Smith? Is just because someone else is someone else in the marketing department has sent an email. Like, yeah, no, and there's some there's some crazy techniques going on with that. Um, some of these health supplements, I get an email from like Natural Sherpa, those companies. Oh yeah, I could show you in my inbox. They do the most, like, does your pee stink? Are you farting too much? I mean that 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 will be this not the subject line, but the sender's name. I mean, it really gets your attention. Um, but it's just you know, obviously, it depends what kind of niche you're in, if that's going to work for you or not but it's, um, it's I, interesting it's a bit of a gimmick i think that was the total gimmick but you know these are these these are some very big companies and they must be doing well with it because you know, they keep showing up in my inbox that way yeah but i will say that the opening of your email like i definitely spent i never half asked that i really mm. think you need to if you don't grab somebody's attention and hint that this is going to be worth their time and be entertaining or give some nugget or dopamine hit in that first paragraph or two then i don't know i just think that's like super important because if you train if, if as soon as i open an email and it's got an ordinary opening i'm almost out yeah uh, if, if, if it's from a sender i like i'll give them some rope yeah. but for the most part you, you've lost me i'm out or if it's got a sort of big intimidating opening paragraph that's about 12 lines long yeah no it's it's you know the opening hook is just um is just is just so important because here's the thing if you give somebody an interesting experience or something funny or something entertaining or just some kind of morsel right up front and they and they they don't even make it to the end of your email that's fine they got something out of it so they're probably going to open up your next one yeah once you've got someone's attention is, is there anything we can talk about for keeping them reading or is it just a case of making sure that the story isn't entertaining and engaging all the way through yeah um you know what do they say is it is in script writing or novel writing um no it's, it's script writing because novels definitely can take their time and be very circuitous but uh 
you want an element of change or a shift as quickly as possible, almost mm. from paragraph to paragraph. You know this about storytelling. You know, mm. you wrote about it in your book. You talked about the ups and downs. Yeah, if you can somehow, if you can somehow do that in an email, um, to just keep their attention. You know, there's that classic copywriting technique of using ellipses at the end of a sentence at the beginning. I do a fair amount of that. I find that kind of tedious, but like, like sometimes I find that I've done it on like three paragraphs in a row. I'm like, oh no, I need to like, <laughs> I need to go go easy on these. Yeah, I actually made fun of it in one email. I I did it so many times. I started talking about it in the email. You <laughs> yeah. see what I'm doing here? This is a classic copywriting technique. And it, it kind of wears on me, but a lot of people make good use of it. I kind of went on and on. Um, and that was fun because I always wanted to make fun of that technique. So there's 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 a balance there. But um, so that that's one thing. And you know, you definitely want to break up um maybe every paragraph doesn't have to be a single sentence, but but close to it. Because mm -hmm. a long, intimidating block of type is just people are in a hurry. They're not going to stick with it <clears throat> unless it's yeah. a really extraordinary thing you're saying. But um, just, you know, mm -hmm. kind of get to the point. And I'm not as big a fan. You know, everyone says you need to write like you've heard of the Hemingway app. Everyone uses the Hemingway app because mm -hmm. the, the whole idea is to write at a fourth grade level or lower. And there's copywriters out there that brag, I got a second grade level today on my Hemingway app score. I think that's a little bit... Um... But did it sound like you is the question. Right, exactly. And I kind of like going the other way a little bit, uh, making, I like mixing it up. Short, punchy sentences combined with some longer ones. And they, they still have to be good sentences, but there's got to be some flow there too. Yeah, I agree. And... Assuming that you're selling your products, I mean, are you usually including a call to action to something or are you more often building up to a call to action that's going to come like in a different email? Yeah, well, you know, uh, in 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 client work, um, we kind of usually map out a calendar. And so we go through nurture phases and then launches and then right. But so in evergreen emails, I think it's okay not to have a CTA, but I don't like to not have a CTA for an extended period of time. Mm. Like right now, I'm in a phase with my list where I'm not really doing heavy CTAs because I'm I'm building up to, to launch something pretty soon. Yeah. And uh, so I think that's okay. But, you know, I think it's perfectly fine to write an evergreen type email and have a call to action in every single email. There's no reason not to do it. Um you know, as long as it's not super hypey and annoying, but being, being very clear and direct in your CTAs is, is very good either. Don't, don't undersell, don't sell from your heels. And of course, during launch time, you can make it very direct and maybe even almost eliminate the storytelling. But, um, so it's, it's diff different phases, but, uh, there's no, no, no harm in selling stuff all the time. Yeah. I've seen different people do it both ways and do it very successfully. So Perry Marshall was one example who came to mind with his daily email and he's, he's always got a call to action in it and and that's fine because the emails are still valuable um so he he was one example but then I've definitely had had clients where we've had better results by ha having this kind of product launch phase so you're selling for this period and then around that you're just laying the groundwork you're building for it Yes. Because otherwise everyone's in like sell, sell, sell mode. And it, it wears a bit thin, I think. And it wears a bit thin for the email base, but it also wears a bit thin for you because I, I I don't have the personality like that where I want to be all go, go, go all the time. I like to have sort of follow periods where I kind of digest and think about things. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're putting stories in your emails and they're good stories, you can get away with selling in every single email. Mm -hmm. But I agree with you. I'm kind of more um, not do it the same way. But um, I think it helps to have the deadline because the thing about the about the product launch is there's a there's a date involved, and that date and that scarcity I think is what makes a big difference because you can you can work around that date and then it and then the train leaves the station and that 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 goes away. Um, yeah, and it seems more special that way too. Yeah. If you do nothing but evergreen emails then where's the urgency unless yeah. you kind of drop in a, a discount code and you go, look, this I'm doing a flash sale or whatever, and it's going to end Thursday at midnight. Yeah. Um, well, what Perry seems to do is each, each month, the, the incentive for 
joining new renaissance seems to change and you'll offer you know a discount on the tactical yeah. triangle review or something right mm-hmm. yeah he's got he's got plenty of things to offer and he mixes it up really well his his email marketing is really pretty dialed in and when you ha- that's another thing if you have a lot of offers if you have a product line that's pretty broad there's all sorts of options you have if you know if you're not just selling one thing yeah and i guess he he does have the dates as well because he's, he's got you know the city tour events he's got his traffic workshop next month or the month after or whatever it is so there's there's, there's definitely some dates on the horizon there as well that that you can factor in so but i, ju- I just think some kind of scarcity that is genuine i think is kind of required is is acquired is is required Re- required yes yeah. um because you've got to overcome apathy and the and the idea of yeah it feels right but i'll just do it later but right yeah. but the you know the urgency has to be uh legitimate too you yeah, can't sure. make stuff up yeah it people, can't be people, the classic, people are smart yeah oh we had so much so much traffic last night our server crashed and right yeah uh, or or I've had clients where you know this ends at midnight and there's a countdown timer on the landing page and the countdown timer runs out and you go back to that page a week later and the offer is still there with the same price yeah, and they yeah. didn't bother to change um the price or the timer yeah great great is there um there's two more questions so I wondered if there was a book that you go back to again and again that has helped hmm. guide your thinking on this wow that's a great great question uh you know i may, I, I mentioned that book story worthy last time that that's a book i've dived back into more than once and that's interesting because that's that's verbal storytelling and i i know you're familiar with him hmm. um so it's interesting that's that's him up on a stage at these storytelling events and but there's just something about the principles he discusses that that can apply to any format. I agree. Yeah, that's one of my go-to recommendations as well. Some of the other stuff, like you know, um, Donald Miller and Robert Robert McKee, you know, story. That's yes. that stuff is it's very technical, and I don't think for email it's all that useful. Mm. You're not you're not going to go through a whole hero's journey in an email. You basically want to give people a morsel that has, I tell people, use some story elements. Even just some dialogue can kind of tell a story in and of itself. And in an email, that's often plenty enough. I've kind of recommended that Joseph Campbell is probably background reading. Like if you want to go down the storytelling rabbit hole, there's definitely insights there that you can leverage, but it's it's not required. Yeah. No, I'm a big Joseph Campbell fan, but yeah, as far if if we're, if we're talking about marketing and applying it to email, like you said, it's nice to have that as a foundation so you can understand that. Like when I brought up earlier about uh, the shifts, which you wrote about so well in your book, the ups and downs, that's like something that I probably wouldn't have given a lot of thought to. I do naturally. See, I'm one of those writers that I kind of naturally can do it, but had to kind of teach myself to teach others, like what are these actual techniques? And that's where guys like Robert McKee and somebody like, Tim Grawl with Story Grid, they're good at kind of documenting like these things that keep people's attention. And as a result, if I'm watching Netflix now, I'll notice things that um, storytelling techniques that they're, it's it's fun to watch on a second level. You know, mm. I think Robert McKee's book is very good. I mean, quite profound in sections just just in terms of why stories work and he says that stories are life uh, but he, he explains it very well um it is quite a big book but yeah it, yeah i didn't think it was good very good um is there maybe one more one more tip we can leave people with for anyone listening who um is has an email list is either thinking about or or is sending you know regular or semi-regular emails just one more thing that we can leave them with that's going to help them well the the first thing that comes to mind is just i know you're across the pond as they say and you might not be into baseball but just swing the bat so maybe in cricket like like i'm into cricket so it does make sense okay yeah um they play cricket around here there's a field now around here it looks pretty wild i need to learn more about it but anyway um 
just you know because i think people are waiting for the right time to send emails and, and they they think they have to commit to it whole hog before they can start and so just if i had to say one thing it would be get rid of any perfectionistic thoughts just start emailing even if it's just committing to once a week or twice a week and letting it be uh imperfect but once you get in the habit of it it can change your your business and your life I agree. And I think people kind of commit to the schedule. And then as soon as they fall off the schedule, they just let it drop. That's the, temp that's the, that's the temptation. It's like, it's like you've fallen off the horse, so you don't get back on. Yeah. Another, another tip I might give is pick one, like good part, pick one part of the day where you feel the most energy. It's the brave, I call it the bravest part of the day. Um, and just kind of see if you can block that on your calendar. If you're the type to block out your calendar, like just make that your regular and just give yourself permission. I'm just going to sit down for 30 minutes. And if I don't get it, the email finished, I'll finish it tomorrow. But just like, that's my, that's my time that's devoted to the email because it's that fundamental and that important in my business. It's, and it's funny, like that, that time for me has ended up being in the evening where my energy is lowest, but that is the time when I'm least likely to be bothered by kids or other distractions. So it, it just, it just is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's got to work that out for themselves. Yeah. Great. Um, this has been great, Bill. How do people, um, find out more about your work and your website and so on? Yeah. They, they can go to story salesmachine.com just the way it sounds. Um, you'll see my main, my main offer there. If somebody wants to drop me a line, they can certainly do that. My email address is bill at story sales machine .com. Those perfect. are the best ways. Okay, perfect. Well, um, I will make sure that those are on the show notes with the episode and, uh, thank you very much for coming on. If you've enjoyed this episode of the story copyrighted podcast, you'll want to make sure you're on my email list. When you sign up at storycopywriters.com forward slash podcast, I'll also send you my seven day storytelling crash course free by email. Please also make sure you've got a copy of my simple story selling book, which is available from Amazon in paperback and Kindle formats. Thanks for listening. I'll talk to you next time.